Hi, welcome to Angel Snug, where anything can become a canvas for creativity. Furniture is just the beginning. Be prepared to be inspired by a wide range of projects and finishing techniques. Be sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any of the new videos. Having a lifelong love of lighthouses and the areas that they sit in, it was really easy to imagine putting one in our front flower beds as a landscape feature. But as we looked for different styles and sizes, we just simply could not find one that had the style, design, and look that we were looking for because we wanted something that looked more realistic. So, as with many other projects, we made our own. Beginning with figuring out how to engineer this cliff face, which with two creatives in the house, it is a unique process. Starting with a quilt and cement. Yes, a quilt and cement. From there, there was a lot more backward design planning and engineering to figure out how to make each step of this project come together in a workable format, including, among other things, hand applying each stone individually, adding mortar, creating a beacon that revolves, and interior lighting for the lighthouse that's solar powered so that it could be placed anywhere that you wanted to move it to. The buildings alone looked great on the cliff top when they were put there with the grass, but they just seemed unfinished. So more details were planned out, thought about, and added. Beginning with stepping stones for the house and the lighthouse to provide usable pathways after storms and in the inevitable moist air of the sea cliff. In addition, flowers were added by the front door. Then imagining the vistas that you would see, the gorgeous views that we could be seeing. What could be more perfect than adding a fire pit and Adirondack chairs as a place to enjoy them? Next, a tumbling pile of boulders was added to the side of the house for both interest and to tie back to the stones that go down the front of the cliff. That was followed by a meandering stone wall to act as a windbreak and a warning of the cliff's edge. The final pieces added were trees in the back to create texture and balance to the scene. Imagine the wind blowing through those pine trees, causing them to whisper in chorus to the waves crashing at the base of the cliff. By adding the additional details, the scene becomes more complete, more interesting, and invites you in your imagination to feel yourself standing on that cliff, enjoying the space and the sea air. Join us for step-by-step -step videos on how we completed this project. In this video, we're going to be doing the next steps to the lighthouse, which is basically working entirely on the tower to the lighthouse itself. Uh, recreating a new light for it, a new top for it, stoning it, painting it, waterproofing it, basically all the details to make it come to a finished product just like the cabin was. So let's get started. Originally, this piece had a weird rounded top on the top of it that did not look like a lighthouse at all. We've already removed that because we've got an actual working beacon that's going to go up there. These windows are going to be cut out. They're already marked with squares so that they will have regular windows in there and we'll add lights on the inside of this to light up softly at night. This has to be cut out, the door to fit in there, and then all of the space between here and here is going to be stonework, like the cabin. And then this will be painted. The top of the lighthouse will be this piece, which has been cannibalized from two lights that Jim has worked on to put together which will look much more like a true lighthouse top. This board is going to be removed, this circle, and one that comes out larger is going to be in its place so it balances better against this which will be on the very tip top. And then this will have ornate supports coming underneath it the way that the large walkways have on the lighthouse. Before any of the stonework's put on, there's going to be a coat of 
primer put on this. I have no idea of what kind of wood this is. It's something cheap from Asia and it's going to need extra help to give it uh, a watertight consistency. These windows are the same as from the cabin. They've already got glass or plexiglass put behind them so that once these are installed in place, no water will go on the inside of this. The doors will be sealed for the same reason, so no water gets inside. And once the stonework is done, then I'll start working on the actual design colors for the main part of the tower, the lighthouse. The cottage and the lighthouse will butt up flush to each other so that it's one main piece of building. So there will be no separation between these and the stone will all meet up against this and around to help seal that as well, but to give it one fluid look. After all the cutouts for the windows and the door were completed and checked that it was a flush fit, the entire upper portion of the uh, lighthouse tower got three coats of polyurethane on the outside. On the inside, we swabbed it with the uh, Flex Seal, which is a rubber uh, coating that you can get in a spray can. We sprayed it into a cup so that we could use a a brush and swab with it because there was no way it was going to spray in there correctly. But that was done to give this as much waterproofing as possible. We decided the multiple coats of polyurethane was a better choice than just a coat of primer. The black that you see is the black paint that is going to go on the two round rings at the bottom of the lighthouse. The coat is put on here at about an inch up from the bottom and then about an inch down from the underneath of the second ring so that any gaps that happen to show up with the stone when it's applied hide and vanish and I don't have to try to get the paint in behind and underneath any stone to do the finish paint of those rings. We needed an entirely new collar at the top of the lighthouse to accommodate the size of the door that needed to go in that top, air, top ring, which the walkway of the lighthouse light will go around. So that is PVC pipe that we're working on to create that. Jim found an ingenious hack for making perfect circles using a table saw. This is available, information about it is available in YouTube videos. Uh, definitely it's something you have to be very careful doing, but made a perfect circle out of this wood, which was wonderful. The cross marks you see on the circle are marking exactly where the decorative supports for the underneath of the walk ramp will be placed. And by drilling through from that side to the underneath, we're marking where the posts that are the safety 
wall around that walkway will be as well. So everything is spaced perfectly and matches up to the posts the way it should look. Holes have been drilled in the dowel for one layer of one level of chain. The grooves at the top will have chain laid into them going around and then miniature metal doorknobs are used as the very top capper. I used miniature easels to create the ornate pieces at the top of the lighthouse, but they had to be cut off at an angle so that they would lay correctly on the slant to the wall of the lighthouse. Jim used two layers of old uh, faux wood blind slats to create a jig to hold the side of the easel piece in place so that then the angle that we needed to come off could be ground down and off and all of them match exactly. If you look carefully, you can see the cut-ins on it that allow this to lay exactly the same for every one of them. The light-activated superglue was used to get each of these pieces exactly in place against the uh, tower of the lighthouse. And you can see that there is a line on the edge of the board that helps to line up exactly where these pieces need to be so they're not wigwag on this as you go around it. Plastic fades in sunlight no matter what its color. So even though these were a perfect black, they were painted with the same black as the base. The entire base was painted to again help with waterproofing, even though that center portion should not ever be exposed to water. You can see that I'm pulling my brush as an, at an angle as I'm coming toward where the red paint is. That gives you a very crisp edge and you don't get black up onto the red, which you would if you were going straight around the ring of that base. The stone was applied to the base of the lighthouse exactly like the cabin and is now getting the mortar put into it, which is again the leveler. If you're watching this video out of order, go back and find the video where that we did the stoning on the cabin for all the steps. The video that I had made showing how to put the stripes onto, to position them onto the lighthouse, got eaten somewhere, so we don't have it. I did not, we didn't take the top off this because we've got some other ideas and plans for this spare that we've got. So what I've done is I've attached string up here in the top, I've taped it down so it can't pull off, it's been tied to one of these, and then I've taped it under here where I knew my starting point was going to be for the spiral uh, stripe. It actually goes all the way around and on my other one there were larger squares here. So I still want it to go across part of the window and it's just spiraling it down but then on the bottom I left a lot of extra 
because this is going to have to be repositioned several times to get it where it needs to be. So to start with, I'm going to leave it with a little bit of slack and a piece of painter's tape on here, and I'm going to look at where I want it to go. And I'm visually figuring out, to start with, about where I want this to be. It's a work your way around and keep repositioning till you get it where it needs to be. Right now this is coming in as a decent curve back here on this. But I can see that this side didn't slope down as much. I really didn't want that to go across the door. So I'm going to start working back the other direction. Well, once it's stuck to this chalky outside, and before you ever did any of the striping, I had solid painted uh, two coats of the cashmere, so I was not going to have to repaint that. It's a continuous trial and error on this, especially because this has some little straight sides to it that are hard to see. It's not perfectly smooth around. But the distance I have all the way around between the pieces of string is the same going around it. The next thing I did was split the difference between these and that's where I'm going to start making the second round of string on this for the other side of the band of color. one off as well. Oh, that was nice. Well, normally this is quick to tie this, but of course there's a camera going, so it's not. Unfortunately, the surface of this has a powdery coating on it that's really playing havoc with keeping this where I want it to mark this correctly. I'm going to turn the camera off, get this one rearranged, and get it stuck in place so it'll stay. With the chalky finish on the outside of this right now, scotch tape was the best thing. Um, but I would not normally do that if it was painted. The green painter's tape worked beautifully. I had a lot of extra that I cut for this for the same reason so I could make adjustments. It would seem to make sense to just measure down marks on this and wrap this. But, like most things, this is not a perfect tapered cylinder. It's got some flat spots, it's got some rounded spots, so actually putting the, the string on and adjusting up and down until I had 13 centimeters between each one of these was the best option. 
Then also I went back and did just little tiny touches with my fingers to get any of the wobbles out where that you could see because it hit a cornered edge that it looked like it was uneven, adjusting that just enough to fool the eye. So what I'm going to do right now is just go around this underneath the string, putting a light pencil mark on it. Anywhere I've got pieces of tape, I will have to eye that in with a pencil once these lines are all done. This really gets to be an optical illusion when you're trying to decide where you're supposed to be painting. So when I get these lines marked, I will show you what I do to save myself from that. I marked a mark here because I've got tape across this. It's going to keep me from seeing where I am. Now I need to go back and do the other piece of string. You want to be careful not to bump the string with the hand you're marking with to move any of the other string pieces out of place while you're doing this. Now then, before I take any of this string off, I need to mark with little pieces of painter's tape in the middle between the bands for where I would actually want my black stripe to be because it is very hard to keep up with once all this is off and you're just looking at lines around it. Again, if this was on paint, it would lay right down. Then I'm going to take this off, fill in the lines where the tape was. Tape just does not all let go. Let's see if it'll stick to the string. Okay. You want to place the tape on the string when you're applying it to this so that you have as narrow a point as possible between where you're going to have gaps to fill in. And simply repeat the process. Green frog tape is absolutely the best tape to keep from having bleeds when you're doing fine lines like this. What you may not realize, however, is it is only along a quarter inch of each side that the really good seal is. You cannot take this whole piece of painter's tape and run it around here and keep a smooth edge. It's going to bend, it's going to create little jags, it just does not work. So instead, I actually use the narrower, but this will let you see what I was doing. I cut down the middle, and I purposely didn't cut it super perfect so I could see that the smooth edge was my outside edge. This is where I'm painting, is where the tape is, so I need to line up my green tape along this line. And it's only about this length of an inch and a half to two inches is all you can get to line up properly and keep the smooth curve. You can actually do a little bit of curve with this 
and then just flatten it down. You follow that all the way around. Again, the jagged edge, I want it out. So I will come around to this. I followed that line around and I would start laying the tape along that line, overlapping it just slightly. So I'm going to continue to get a seal. I'll bring a piece around to this side where it's a little clearer. Once that band has been created, step back, look at it, any place that it's got a little bit of a jag in it or a straight edge that you don't want, lift that tape off and make the line a smoother curve. Then before painting the black stripe in here, since the base was solid white, you want to take a damp, a wet but not drippy paper towel and run it along the edge here of this tape, which will fully activate the seal on this. And when you paint it and you pull the tape off, you may have a couple of very tiny places that have to be touched up with an artist brush, but it will really keep a nice seal on this so that you can get that band painted. And that's the process. It's a little back and forth, back and forth, but it's worth it to get the beautiful stripe that swirls. So I don't think you really can't see what's going through here, but you can see the, the tape pieces that in here. And then as I start painting this, pull off the tape, but don't take all, all that tape off first. Just paint it as you go and pull it off. Better safe than sorry and having accidentally painted the wrong section, it's really no fun. Thank you. The multiple coats of paint made the window openings tight in places so that the windows would not set flush. So what you're seeing me do is use a razor blade to peel back and peel off strips of the paint so that the windows are a good tight flush fit again. Heavy duty clear silicon caulk that is waterproof is being used to attach the roof to the lean-to connector because that needs to be solidly in place to do the fitting properly for attaching to the lighthouse space. We have completely finished the lighthouse, everything about it, all its wiring, all the touch-ups, all the waterproofing, everything has been done and it is attached to the plastic board you see on the bottom to make it able to be lifted and moved when it needs to be, have lights changed in it, have anything repaired on it. We did not want this to sit straight on the ground in our flower beds because we have a variety of plants of different heights that this is going to be nestled into the middle of. So the next step that we have is we're starting to figure out what the fake stone is going to look like that we are making. It would be impossibly expensive and very hard to maneuver to buy a boulder the size that we need to have this sit on it. So you see a uh, pegboard that's underneath this that this is setting on right now. That's going to form the top of the mold for the rock that we are going to create. And underneath are three big five gallon buckets that are going to act as a support system. So 
that the weight of this, which is pretty substantial, is not going to give on this when we finish with it. So we're finished with this right now to set it aside and we're ready to start building this piece. We're in the final stretch of getting this lighthouse complete. So in this video, I'm going to show you how the grass was painted and why. The stone fence is assembled, the, faux, uh, the fireplace, fire pit rather, the Adirondack chairs, and just all the detailing for how we assembled this and actually installed it. So let's get started. Yesterday, my husband mentioned you've got a lot of rocks still around. What if you did a rock fence? And I happen to think I really liked having one along the border of the edge to kind of be a barrier against stepping off the edge of the cliff that the lighthouse is setting on. But I totally forgot in getting into the idea of just getting started on it and working on it to make a video. So basically what happened was exactly the same as doing the um, stone on the outside of the lighthouse. But instead of applying it to something, I had a rough line that I put down on wax paper so that I could get this off. And then I started stacking stone using the caulk again. And I will say it gets a little tricky because it wants to fall. You have to be slow and deliberate and work carefully with it. But that's how this started. So today I'm gonna to try tipping it on its side with it still attached to the wax paper to help give it some form to put in the mortar on the sides like I did on the stone of the house and the lighthouse and also to see if I can clean up some of the excess caulk before I do that. So we'll see how it goes. All right, we're gonna see how this goes when I tip it and hopefully with it still held to this piece of wet paper it will allow me to tip it without breaking it. Uh -huh, so far so good, but we've definitely got a piece over here that I will have to work on. And having the tape stick to me didn't help. I'm looking at the amount of caulk in here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and fill with The mortar, which is a two to one mix, and do any trimming I need to do afterwards. Some of this is going to drip through, but at least it will start to give this more of a bond. And when this is set, and I've cleaned it, I will turn it over and fill from the other side. So that there will be mortar on both sides of this all the way through. And I knew that was coming, so it's all good. This is fragile, so I'm going to let it sit for a couple of hours before working on the back, and I will add some more glue, or actually more caulk, along the back to help stabilize it before I do any more stone. And that's the point at which I will attach this piece that broke off back better, and this piece, which was loose if the mortar doesn't hold it, 
I will add that to glue that back in. So now let's just wait, let it dry, and wait to be able to do more with it. The more this lighthouse is getting worked on, the more little tweaks and details are getting added to it. Um, I ran across the right size Adirondack chairs and a little fire pit, but I definitely did not want the fire pit to be this plasticky looking thing. So, exactly like I did with the house, I've attached stone, but that's still drying, so it's not ready for me to add the mortar yet. So I'm taking advantage of that while it's drying to get the first coat of a color called Stonehenge by All-in-One Paint by Heirloom Traditions put on to this. And that's pretty much all I'm going to do to the inside of this is to put a couple of coats on it because it's really not going to show and the really cool thing is it's also going to look a little ashy in there. These rocks are the same rocks that everything else in this was made with. It came out of the same bag. Gotta love the giant rock in the middle of the medium sized to teeny tiny rocks. Definitely added some weight but couldn't be used if you were using it for landscaping for, and wanted everything uniform. But anyway, uh, it's working out well for me as a boulder beside the lighthouse. But since the stones that have already been worked with with mortar got a little bit of gray on them from the mortar, it stained them some, I'm going to use um, some of the Stonehenge and water to stain these stones before they get a finish on them to match the other stones. So I'm randomly adding very thin amount of Stonehenge to this because the Stonehenge is a gray, a greenish gray that is similar to the mortar color. Use the wet spot on the paper towel. blend, remove some of it, but just give it a little bit more of the look that the other stone has. And I've got a couple of places where the JB weld that we used to hold these stones together. It's showing through. So I'm using the stone hinge to camouflage that. The last stone I'm going to add some to is this large one. Very much dry brushing it. not changing this this natural stone very much at all but it's got just enough gray on it now to have the same look it would have had if it had had mortar washed off of it Now when this has the top coat put on it, it's going to look like the fence and the stone on the building does. And the last thing I'm going to do while I have this out is I have steps coming down the front of the cliff of the lighthouse, so I'm going to do the same thing that I did to this and this to the rocks over there. Just like regular chairs, these are kind of the pits to paint, but not as bad as it would seem, especially if you use a small brush. And this is a fairly firm bristled brush, which holds into its shape when I'm getting it into the tiny spaces.
It's just remembering to check every one of those sides. Have I gotten every little piece of this thing? I'm letting the bristles of the brush go in between the slats to get those sides painted. Going back, checking for any drips or globs. or any missed spots. Then becomes the fun of trying to figure out how you're going to get it down on the paper. And I missed a couple spaces. I want to touch it as little as possible with the plastic. Got that marked back again. And start on the next one. Do the underneath side first, just like on a regular chair, because otherwise you will smear off all the paint you put on the front side. <clears throat> this is the one coat of Stonehenge. This chair has been lightly dry brushed with a very, very dry, dry brush to add some aging to it, which is the look I wanted. I wanted it to look like the Adirondacks had been sitting out there in the sea air for a long time and not freshly painted. So that one's done. And I will show you what I'm doing with this. Very little paint is on there. I'm dabbing off what I don't want. This piece of plastic hanging here. There we go. If I had very much paint at all on here, this would be giving this a solid coat of paint, which I do not want. And I'm hitting this fairly, because there's so little paint on this brush, I'm hitting this pretty hard to get the paint to come off on it. Double check I got that. Yes, I did. And just like a regular chair, I'm following the grain. The way the wood would be in an actual real chair. edges first of the chair arms and the top last. That way you won't get any ridges of paint up on the top. The color I'm using over these is almond. After looking at these after they had dried overnight and looking at them in morning light, they're a little bit whiter than what I want and not quite the drifty aged look. So on this chair, I have added a little bit of vintage brown antiquing gel onto it. Very dry brush again, actually very, just hardly any paint on it at all. But that is going to, that's what I'm going to do with the rest of these. Just like I did before, I'm tapping almost everything off of it. Thank you. 
You want the finishes to look very similar, but they don't have to be an exact matchy match. Because wood ages differently, some of these chairs may be older, newer. It was important to figure out exactly how the lighthouse base was going to be placed onto the faux stone. We knew and had already looked at where we were going to place it in the yard, so we knew we wanted the stone facing straight on, but we wanted the lighthouse to be at an angle for better viewing of it in our yard. So the bottom left of the screen of the photo, you can see a flatter edge that's going to be the front of the stone. And this allowed me to mark out a minimal amount of base for the faux stone and still create an organic line for it that I knew I'd be working off of. Due to the size, the best place to lay out our outline for the grass was out on our driveway and all of the pieces were taped together using painter's tape just because it stuck really well on the uh, wax paper. These pieces are all flat, lined up. We know they're exactly the way they would be if we were able to drop it down straight over the lighthouse. As you are cutting it though, it needed to be cut from the back side of the grass to keep from having choppy two short pieces and a lot of uh, shaggy look on the grass. But when you turn it over, the back side of the grass is a black plastic. The other thing that is super important to remember is because you have turned the grass upside down, the pattern has to be flipped upside down as well for it to actually fit onto the uh, lighthouse grounds correctly. If you cut it with the pattern right side up, it won't fit. It'll be flipped backward and would, you'd only be able to fit it with the black side up. The easiest way to cut it was with very sharp razor blades and we discovered and thought about ways to do different markings of this pattern and decided that a light spray of white spray paint was the quickest and fastest way to give us an edge that we could cut around, both for the outside and for the center portion where the lighthouse would stand. We realized when we were editing that all of the film of me actually painting the grass that went on the lighthouse was not there. It must not have recorded or shut down. So this grass is actually been painted, um, but this area has less paint on it. So I'm going to show you just in this area what that I did to do with this. Um, it was using a pure green Trinity, a slate green Envy, Crete, which is an olive green, and then tapestry um, to give some of the dried grass areas. Um, I'm not gonna do a large piece of this, um, obviously, I'm not dressed for it. We have someplace else we need to be. But one of the things that you have to do with the grass is it wants to lay down from the shipping. So you have to push it up so that you're not just painting a flat surface and you're going to use the dry brush technique. That's something that while I was painting the whole thing, I was constantly doing with my hands after applying paint, brushing that up. I'm not going to do that right now because it will spit all over me and my outfit. I know, I should have gone and changed clothes for you, but didn't feel like it. So that is something that you have to keep doing and you're going to go in different directions, even with the dry brush, to hit this with different amounts of color. You're not doing a solid coat of any of these colors. You're just adding in variegation and that's why dry brushing is so important. You put some onto the brush, pounce most of it off, and then start working. The first color that I applied to really mute that bright plasticky green was the Envy, which is the slate green. There's not a ton of it on the brush. And then going in different directions with it. The 
get most of it out. Add some of the bright primary green into that and not putting it heavily. It's easier to see it here than probably on the camera. You can actually see the different colors. Then applying the olive green. You can pick some back up. You can go and mix all of the paints that are pounced on your, your plate into there. All of that helps to add to a natural look with this paint. And definitely, if you're doing a large piece of this, wear something you don't care gets paint on it because it will spit onto you. That Those layers were allowed to completely dry before I came back in with a little bit of tapestry, which is a khaki, which really, when I took it out to the yard, pretty much matched the color of the dry, dry grass in our yard. This you want to be very light with. You're not trying to get tons of dead grass, but you need some because no matter how beautiful a yard is, there's some dried grasses out there. And the last thing I did then was with my hands, doing this so there's not solid. And then if there was any place that needed more color, going back and adding it in, layering those greens, and if need be, more of the tapestry. It's kind of a trial and error. Less is more. Put on less paint because you can always add more, but if you have big globs of solid colored areas, you cannot correct those. It's much easier to see the difference in the grass when you see them side by side. The left is how it came shipped in, and it's very shiny, very plasticky, and does not look as natural as what's been painted and has more the look of grass growing in the yard. The added benefit of having painted this with the HTP paint is that it's not going to fade out over time. While the base of the, the faux stone base that we created is very strong, can handle a lot of weight, when you actually uh, screw into it or drill into it, it's not of a heavy thickness and it also is very easy to uh, break out the uh, concrete over time with screws. So the round metal based uh, anchor that you see was used uh, as the base pieces for both the uh, trees and for the screws going down into the base through the white plastic mounting board that you've seen earlier in the videos. Those were put in upside down and were anchored in with JB Weld. The white and green are of different sizes because we actually chose anchor pieces that matched the size of the wire bases of the trees that we would be adding so that they would fit tightly in there, but we did not want to glue them in. We wanted to be able to replace them as they weathered over time. To adhere the grass to the top of the faux stone, we, had, we did a combination of things. All along the edge of the cabin, the lighthouse base, a bead of caulk was put down, but we added that caulk as we were moving around when we had the grass in place 
uh, to press it into place and then went back just along the uh, house and the lighthouse edges with a nail gun with small brads to nail through the grass into the white plastic base to just help it stay in place and stay down tight. Along the outer edge of the entire thing, about a quarter of an inch in underneath, a bead of caulk was run and a bead of caulk was also run along where the seam met and that did have a few brads put into it to keep it from pulling apart with weather and water. That way, by only using caulk along those edges, we were going to be able to lift that off without a lot of damage if we had to pull the lighthouse off to do any repairs to lighting or anything else. Um, you can see on the left the lighthouse beacon pieces that we used. We also added an extension so that the photo on the right shows our finished full top to the lighthouse. It is more balanced in scale for the whole tower and you need to think about when you're trying to create something like this, think out of the box. What kinds of things are there? The first red beacon on its own was a cute beacon but when you actually turned it on, the light inside was just overpowering. But by changing out the lens area's cover area to the one that is in the black light that has those striations in it, you've got a much prettier beacon light at night and it dimmed it so it wasn't just flashing. It, was, it gave more of the rotation feel that we wanted. So when you're designing things like this, it's kind of thinking out of the box, looking for different things and planning what could I use to make this look the way I want it to look as a finished piece. When selecting trees, I had to hunt for quite a while because I needed something that was plastic based but looked more natural. So it took me a while to find both that kind of texture and the height differences that I needed. So I was knew exactly the ratios by measuring up on the tower of the lighthouse for how high I wanted the trees to be behind the house and along the tower. And then I looked for a variety of colors and textures. The center trees that you see were very easy to just have the wire because they just had the, uh, a plastic base like a Christmas tree has to come off of them but the tree on the left with the pine cones in it actually had a big chunk of concrete on it that we had to knock off literally with hammers. I had thought by the pictures that I was seeing on the site that I ordered it from that the pine cones were going to be a realistic size and look good with the lighthouse. When they came in they were ridiculously oversized so I had to cut all of those off but the shape of that tree was a perfect counterpoint to have a different species in amongst all of them. The smaller trees had plastic bases on them that had to be popped off of the wire and then that allowed us to put them into the anchors that you saw earlier to place them where we wanted them and uh, have a natural look behind the lighthouse. Mommy has something important to say. Thanks for sticking with us through this project. If you happen to miss other videos, there's a total of seven. So subscribe to our channel and you can find them all. But from start to finish, from looking at this to where it is now, we're very happy with the project and looking forward to years of enjoying it. Thanks for joining us and Dakota says, thanks for getting it done, Mom. You did good, Mommy. I'm the project supervisor for Angel's Nook. It is my job to make sure my humans focus on giving you clear and precise instructions. And let me tell you, sometimes it's like herding foxes. Wait a minute. Don't you mean cats? I chased a cat once. And let me tell you, it was not my finest hour. Well, for one thing, you silly furball, it's cats. Secondly, you're not supposed to be in the flower bed. And finally, 
you're sitting in my spot. <laughs>